archivist, y'all. Word. Exclusively. With the mad line in the background. <laughs> Hell yeah. Vancouver represent. Exclusively interviewing people under the stairs. Yep. And who is the P, the lethal duel, on top of the pyramid, fanning out the cards with all those bookmarks, people under the stairs? Fanning out every day, dude. Yeah, man. People under the stairs, man, we're two big dummies from L.A. that yeah. love music, you know what I'm yeah. saying? We love music, you know, more than we probably love ourselves, but, you know. That's, that's what brought us together, right. that's who we are, that's who will always be music first, you know? Word up. And let's go to the foundation, Peck Park Child Care and K Day. Yeah. To yeah. the meet at uh, Alexander Hamilton, Los Angeles, Freestyle Fellowship, and the 12 inches and the Gemini tape deck sampling. Wow, he got the. That's basically Cliff Notes version that's, that's of our our, childhood. Yeah, that's our childhood right there, man. Alexander Hamilton. That's where I went to high school. Tell them about the Hamilton, man. Hamilton, Hamilton is a motherfucker, man. Hamilton, Hamilton. Uh, that's the high school in West LA. That's where I went to school. Also, my buddy Merce went there. Shout out to the homeboy Merce. Animal style. Uh, Scared went there. Born Moon from the Houston Oilers went there. Pretty dope school. So it's an art magnet, you know what I mean? So it was a lot of music going on. Forgot, music forgot about going. Eli, man. Oh, he Eli, out. Eli. I'm sorry, man. A lot, yo, a lot of times the cats went there, man. You know, and we started out like tenth grade, just freestyling every day at lunch, bringing the turntables, setting them up at pep rallies. You know, one of my main things was not wanting to see other DJs come out to come, you know, come into the school and DJ because I knew I was a badass DJ. And after a while, I got the slot. I was doing all the pep rallies. As you can see on Stepfather DVD, you know I didn't play the songs they wanted to hear. I just scratched it. Let the whole voice freestyle. Yeah, and then yeah, like Kool Aid and shit. And yeah. then he ended up DJing at my high school. Yeah, and it I just so happened he, he DJed a winter. I about yeah, this he DJed a winter formal, and I got <sighs> stood up, and I was the only motherfucker. I had I had rented the suit, I had the boot near, I had the whole shit, and I went to pick up the girl, and I opened the door, and her boyfriend had the door, and he was like, "She's not going." So I said. I went back, I was like 17, I went back to the car, I was like, well, I could either go home and face my parents who paid for all this shit, or I could just go. So I said, fuck it, I, and I went. And, and this dude was DJing, I just stood by the turntables on it, like, you like J-Ru? Oh yeah? yeah? You like Fellowship? Or, and that was it, you know, and then, you know. But uh, in Peck Park, that was me, that was the, the public park near where I grew up, and we used to play caroms and listen to K-Day. And Caroms and K-Day, baby. You know, drink Life the frozen grape juice cups. Dudes from LA know what time it is, man. Chalupas. Soggy tater tots, chalupas. We called them taco boats. Tacos, yeah, I'm not hip to that. You didn't, yeah, but it was a boat. It was a boat, was a boat with a tie. Yeah. yeah, you know, we put the hot sauce on it. But uh, it's some real LA um, latchkey kid. You know, everyone's parents around that time, everyone was, was struggling working. and working. Yeah. And it was Reagan eras and whatever. And so we had a choice. Really, in LA, it was pretty simple. If you didn't have parents around, you could either Get into trouble, right. get into music, get into graffiti. Or get into school and do your work. Yeah, get into school. <laughs> that was no fun. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, I was getting into Curtis Blow or whatever, you know. <laughs> Fucking guy. And Double K, back in high school, share about bringing your turntable, your neighborhood, and the homie Bluefoot, and Foreman with Thez One back in 97. Oh, man. All right, well, you know, I was a fuck up in school. My whole thing was hip hop, funk music. You know, I, that's what I wanted to do in school. I was teaching other kids about music instead of getting taught about, you know, academics and shit. I'd go to school every day with records, trade with other DJs and shit, act like I was going to class. And then shout out Jedi, who's now DJing, who's been DJing with Planet. Shout out my man Jedi. Uh, so I asked Miss Rainey, who was. Uh, the lady who would hire all the DJs to come up to the school and DJ, you know, which was like rivals of ours. I can't remember their names, which is good, you know. And, you know, I was like, yo, I'm a DJ. I submitted a little tape of me blending all the dope songs of the day. And uh, she was like, okay. And actually paid us. And I got to leave school before lunch to go get the equipment. And, you know, bullshit. And that was it, man. I was the DJ of Hamilton. Excellent. And as far as the homie Bluefoot, that's, that's the big homie right there. Unicycle. Oh yeah, Unicycle. He's probably on it right now, 52nd Street, man. It's, that's, to me, man, LA, that is, for people who don't understand LA, <laughs> what you need to understand about LA is it's not whatever the fuck you think it is. LA is filled with characters. Yeah. You know, we live in a we live in a land that's wonderful because it's filled with people who are unicycle riding ex gang members. Right, right. Who take your shit and yeah. play you a cassette tape of Confunction. Right, right. Tell you to right. shut up. 
this is that's what LA is. LA is not whatever you see on TV or this or that, whatever. It's, that's it's, there. That's there. But yeah. no one from LA gives a fuck about that. Right. It's the people who move to LA from butt fuck Iowa that wants to you know see the stars. You know what I mean? And they get there and they end up on crack, trying to get back to Iowa. You know? All the things they that eat you up, man. Yeah, all the things people love about LA come from people like us or Bluefoot or people who are part of that. And it's, it doesn't come from the people who move, you know, who move there and they think it's a, something from a TV show. Because LA does have a culture. People who aren't from LA like to pan LA, like LA ain't about shit. It's just TV and Hollywood or whatever. But uh, fuck that, man. We gave you guys gangster rap, saggy pants, skateboarding. Yeah. Stop locking. Yeah, you know, right. A lot, a lot of stuff came from the West Coast, man. Surfing. Beach you know? Boys. Beach Boys. Yeah. Sure. And the first show, Mr. Bongo, Defunct Beat Nonstop, and the first LP, The Next Step, the B-Boy stances, and touring with Canada's Kid Koala, it's all about the beginning. Word. Yeah, our first in story. Well, let's, let's talk about Mr. Bongo's. So, even, even before that, in 98, we put out our record independently. And we thought... Now, this is important to note, since we're archiving shit, so I'll go ahead and put it on the line. We pressed up the vinyl for the next step, and we took it around to people who we thought were contemporaries and friends of ours, and they still are for the most part in LA, and we're like, hey, play our record, play our record. No one played our record. As far as we knew, our record wasn't getting any fucking run. Except for the homeboy DJ Rob One. Rest in peace, Rob Rest One. Peace, Rob CBS. One. All right, go ahead. So, as far as we knew, that shit kind of tanked out the gate. Didn't really matter to us because all we cared about was smoking beanies and hanging out, whatever. So whatever. But what we didn't know was that almost every single copy of that record got, had gotten shipped to Mr. Bongo's in London. And that, as the story goes, they got the record in, they put the record on the turntable to play in the speakers in the store. And every single motherfucker in the store said, yo, what is that? And they bought it. And the owner of Mr. Bongo's picked up the phone and called the only person he could get a hold of on the west coast which was the owner of home records he said yo find a way to get me more people on stairs 12 inches because we just sold all of them and i need a favor i need you to get me more of these and chris the owner of home being the smart duty was said you know what instead of getting you more more of these 12 inches i'm gonna get you i'm gonna go get these motherfuckers right right, right and he right. literally came came to the crib came to record all that stuff man and uh shit sat down Listen, watch us make beats and, and record and next thing you we know got we were up in San Francisco and uh, we signed our own records and then we went on tour right and we went to Mr. Bongo's and did a install August 1999 yep. first world tour people in the and Double K Saturn Street Talent back in 1985 how do you know about that the four track and the recording oh, yo Saturn. and Lord Radio Lord Radio right here, yo. That was my first time on stage. It was Saturn Street Elementary School is the, the school I went to from first grade to third grade. And that was the talent show in the third grade. And me and my homeboy, I can't remember his name, it saved my life. We were like the only two fat dudes at the school who loved rap music and the fat boys. So there was a talent show coming up and I wanted to do the fat boys are back because that was like my favorite song at the time. And he was down, we both knew all the words. We had our outfits ready, feelers, you know, lokes and shit. Couldn't find the instrumental. There is no instrumental to it, so my aunt took me to Music Plus and bought me the album, and uh, we did it, and we won first place, man. This the fucking place went crazy, man. Went crazy. I can imagine. I have pictures too. I have pictures. Actually, it's on my Facebook. You can check it out. Yeah. Yeah. And the four track together, you guys, record. The four track era yeah. was the fucking era. If I could go Most back fun, in time, man. yeah. Most if fun. I could go back in time, I would give all this fame shit up, touring, whatever. If I could just go back and relive like those couple of years where it was just every fucking day I would wake up going to Double K's house. Yeah. Cassette tapes, filters, Gemini sampler. And what we would do is we had the Gemini sampler, we would loop something up, put it on the first track of the cassette right. tape, right. the drum loop on the second track. And then and then we get the vocal sample or some scratches on the third. Right. And, then use the and like a filter. Remember right. like sometimes I do like a filter and build beats on a cassette tape. And uh Man, that was like, that was just, you know, fucking we would bounce it down and rap over it. Yeah. Or have somebody else rap over it. Those are the days when I remember trying to chop my own drum breaks up on it. I would get a hi-hat going on track three, then play that back and then do a kick 
on the Gemini sampler and then get a snare and do that and have three tracks with my little weak ass drum break and then use number four for a loop. Suck, but you know, I was trying. I mean, a lot of dudes, <laughs> I mean, I guess it turns out a lot of dudes were doing shit like that. So be it, you know, but we wanted it that bad. And, and to go through that period of time where you wake up and you're just like, fuck, how can I make a hip hop beat? How can I go to sleep with a hip hop beat? You just want it that fucking bad, man. We did, we wanted it that bad. And here we are. And Lord Radio? Well, so I used to have this record. We were, we're fucking clowns, man. People don't know. We're working on exposing this more. But, uh, you know, like, we would do stupid shit with old records. Like, he had this fucking Roy Ayers record that I really, really wanted. And so, like, I kind of lied to his mom. And I, I went and knocked on the door. Finally, we're getting this out there to everybody. You tell him. <laughs> I went and knocked on the door. I, I really home. wanted to loop that shit up really I, fucking bad. I wasn't home. He wasn't home, and I knocked on the door, and his mom answered, and I was like, I was like, oh, hey, moms, um, Mikey said that I could borrow the, uh, that Roy, this Roy Ayers record, so, is he home? And she was like, no, he's not here. I was like, well, he said I could just grab it, so if you don't mind, I'm just gonna go up to his room and get it. I kind of stole that shit. And guess what? The first thing I wanted to do when I got home was listen to that fucking Roy Ayers record. I knew exactly where it was. I went, I said, where's my Roy Ayers record? Oh, Chris was here. That motherfucker. I called him and he was like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> he said he gave it back, but I don't remember that. I gave it's it all good. Jesus, it's all good. I, I shouldn't have done that. That was horrifying. It's all good, man. Yeah. That's why we're brothers, you know? And the significance of Martin's record shop on West Pico Boulevard? Wow, man. The significance, buddy. That raised super that raised fucking us. significant. And I want to shout out my man Martin. He's no longer rest the living with us, you know. Martin was uh, our big homie. You know, when he told us, you got sucked, but I'll support you, you know. And it was us, Merce. We would be in that store every day, just not buying anything, just sitting around absorbing the vibe. People coming in to buy records, drop records off, and just sitting, smoking weed, chilling out. You know, I smoked weed with Smith and Wesson out in front of that store one time. Just like, oh shit, you know? So pick up Martin's record, man. I mean, if there was no Martins, I would have never met this dude. That's where we met. You know, besides the first time when I was DJing yeah, no, at right. school. And I mean, I don't think I don't think Martin got to live to understand the impact that he had. He he he, he thought we wouldn't really be shit. But that's why we loved him. Yeah. He was like a character from a Martin episode or right. something. But he was like that old dude that everybody has. Like, oh, shut the fuck up. Yeah. But, but, you know, he'll give you a pound on the back say that's good, but be like, oh, yeah, shit, just, you know. He did the same thing to Merce. Merce's grandparents lived right around the corner. They lived a half a block away. And so, you know, Merce was over there all the time. And I mean, his influence in Merce, us kind of learning how the record, the retail side of the record game, watching Derek, Martin, and then run the record store, you know, it really taught us a lot. I lied to my mom one time. She wanted me to get a job. And right after high school, I told her I was working at Martin's, like sweeping and shit. And uh, cause that's where I was at every day. I'd get on number seven, go to Martin's. So she called one day and I walked in the bar and he was like, man, you told your mom you work here? I was like, oh fuck. So I gotta face him and I gotta go back home and talk to mom. I was like, you ain't got no job. Dude, crazy shit used to happen at Martin's. One time we were both hanging out in Tumex. We know it's Alex shout back out. then. Shout, shout out Tumex. They just threw away all the Freestyle Fellowship records at the 4th and Broadway in the dumpster. That was Krondon. It was Krondon who said? Okay, yeah. it was Krondon who said. So anyways, motherfuckers were scrambling for the car, and sure enough, 4th and Broadway took all the Eric B. and Rock Cam, all their fucking Fellowship, every fucking thing, and they threw it in a dumpster. They just put the records in the dumpster, and dudes were in the dumpster pulling the records out, trying to salvage this shit. It was an unbelievable era, man. We had so many comments since I used to love her 12 inches and was, Wu-Tang Clan Cream. I was, I was promoting for Ruthless Records and Loud Records in my senior year of high school. And uh, through a cat named Mike Karen who went on to sign cats like T.I. and shit like that, you know. Rich dude lived in Beverly Hills, but he knew we had the talent. But here's the Canada connection. Before he did that, he put out Socrates. Socrates, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout to Socrates. Shout out Socrates. That shit, that, shit, that was a dope yeah. call. EP. Big time. And uh, I had like boxes of this at the house. Cream 12 inches. I had boxes where I used to love her 12 inches. And Ad Band Clan. Ad Band Clan. Uh, we used to go to those other soundtracks. And that was my, my, my duty. Was I had to go to school, put up stickers all around the neighborhood, pass out records. I kept the records. Me and this dude one day didn't have no jobs. And we figured, well, Martin could use all these. I used to love her. Because we need some beanies, whoppers, and weed, and maybe a 40 later. We went and sold them for about 50 bucks, 25, I don't even 20 bucks. Yeah, I don't even mind not even defend that much. <laughs> it was gone by the end of the night. But you you remember um, Double ended up with a roll 
like a straight fucking roll of stickers, of Wu Tang stickers, like gold 36 chamber stickers that were dope as fuck, and we put them up. We should have just kept they're still, them. There's still, they're, they're still spots in my neighborhood where they're up, you know, when I was walking home from school, putting them up everywhere, stop signs and shit, you know. What about the coins? Wu-Tang didn't forever. have those, didn't have those, didn't have those. What about the chair with the damage of the black soap? soap. Come clean know about soap. that, the come clean soap. Or the artifacts markers, man. There's a lot of dope promotional tools back then. And the question in the form of an answer, the album, the idea of the Ice Castle in Europe, the American huh. Men mixtape, and selling more are. than 100k of units, and over 21 successful tours to date. Man. So what was the first pretty one Pretty loaded question, What was the first man. one? The question in the form of an answer, man. That, that was our second album. I remember me and this dude driving down the 10 freeway. And it always happens like this, just out of nowhere. We were driving down the 10 freeway past Robertson, I believe, on our way somewhere to a party in UCLA. I said, uh, we should call the next album question in the form of an answer. And I know when he likes something, because he'll just look at me and shake his head. And that was it. Question of form and answer came out that people like the Ice Castles. That movie, let's tell me about Ice Castles. Ice Castles is widely considered the worst movie of all time. I love it. I'm proud to be, I'm proud to say that we made it. It is probably by and large the worst movie, if you're even going to call it that. It's kind of a collection of, but it was filmed on location in in Europe, so that's, it's got that going for it. Right. And uh, it has Stonehenge. It says Stonehenge. It is a, it's a fairly, it's a fairly awful movie. It's included when you buy the Stepfather album by Pete Martin Stairs, our, our, that was our one, two, three, four, fifth album. Right. Um, it's, just, it, it's really who we are. Like you said, we're clowns, man, and we're, we're trying to exploit that a little bit more because us sitting in the car driving city to city, man, it's just nothing but jokes and jokes. We're not talking about how we're going to hit the crowd that night. It's like, man, we're just bagging and talking shit. We'll see a dog and, you know, we're just silly, you know what I mean? So we want to do this thing called the Mike and Chris show to show people that we're, we're you know, we're junkies for funny, you know? People think that we, people think, and I mean, rightly so, I don't think that they, that they should be faulted for it, but they think that we sit around listening to underground hip hop, freestyle on the way to the shows and this and that, stop, do a little graffiti, break dance in the subway, and uh, that's absolutely not the case. I mean, we're so fucking hip hop that we're not hip hop anymore. Right. Like this shit, imagine going back to what we talked about earlier, two kids who woke up every fucking day for a, a decade, and live, breathe, and eat, finding old records, making beats, this and that, and now we're touring, and it's like, when we get in the car, we aren't gonna listen to fucking hip hop. You know why? Because I can hear Come Clean in my head. I can lay in bed and think about Come Clean. I can hear the whole fucking thing sequentially. I've heard it that many times at clubs. It's been hip hop playing the whole time. So when we get in the car, we bump like Michael McDonald, the Doobie Brothers, you know what I mean? Just fucking weird shit, because it's like you like music, man. Yeah, like man. We want to take a march somewhere else instead of staying in one place. You know, it's like you know, doing it and not coming. You know, that's how. All right. Over and over, the same thing. An essential fest: Bonnaroo 09, Glastonbury, Coachella, Governor's Ball, the House of Blues, selling out China. Boston toured everywhere except Antarctica. Right. Highly recognized duo, more than eight LPs on the Billboard charts. Y'all up in the clouds soaring. Yo, Essentials Festival. That shit was that fucking festival, crazy. That's like forever embedded in my brain, man. Cause it was a festival with a lot of big hip hop backs on it, including De La Soul, J. Rue, um, LP Funk was there on another stage, Public Enemy, Ice T, Biz Marky. Jurassic Five, That's it. Ugly Master Ace, Master Ace. Ace, and you know, so we get there. We're all staying in the same hotel, and it's me, Chris, and uh, my boy Jazz Mac, third member of the P. You know, we're backstage hobnobbing with all these dudes, hanging out with Ice T, Ice T, uh, Chuck D's there, Flavor Flav's there. Man. It was a festival, but it was a hip hop festival, right at the pinnacle of that shit in Europe. So they didn't spare any expense. They got everyone who fucking mattered to be at that festival. And the fact that we were there, that was a big honor, man. Hell Not yeah, dude. We rolled the plane home with Ice-T. Yeah. j opened for us that day. It was fucking crazy, man. Biz Marquee. Biz Marquee. Shout out to Biz Marquee. Shout out to Homie Biz. recognized us first. Yeah, uh, man. A lot of people, man. And I love Biz Marquee. He grew up to Biz, you know. You know, that's what hip-hop is. You know, you had N.W.A. coming out of the West Coast. 
gangster, gangster, this, this, this. But then you had Biz Marquee back east talking about picking boogers. You know, you can you can pick what vibe you want to be on. Now it's like everyone's trying to pump that same thing to you. you know? And I want to say on uh, in remarks to that and and what you were talking about, like with the Billboard stuff, like we have had some success in the legitimate field. But I I can say, and I know I speak for my brother Double K, that there have been moments in our career that I felt like I was successful. That brought me to tears damn near. And one of those moments was when Chuck D got on stage after a show we did in New York and basically yelled at the crowd about how dope we were and how they needed to recognize. Shit like that has mattered in my life when I'm on my deathbed, will, will and continue to matter more than any sales. Uh, we put that shit in our bio and it's online, whatever so people know about because most people don't understand hip hop. But I think if you're into hip hop, you understand the feeling of being recognized by someone you look up to. That's a real hip hop. That's thing. like Eric Clapton having, you know, when BB King walked into him and said, Yo, man, I dig your style. You know, for Eric Clapton, I was like, Oh shit, you know, I look up to you. You know what I mean? So both of us, I'm, I'm a very big public enemy head. Growing up, that was my favorite group, like, out of all of them, you know? So that Chuck jump up on stage and be like, People on the stairs, I've been waiting to see them. They're the shit, y'all check them out. Or to have Biz call us and say, yo, you guys are doing a good job, keep the movie started going. Or people like that, you know. Makes, I there's, said, there's been a lot of dicks, too. There's been a lot of New York dudes and older dudes. Shout out to Greg Nice. Greg Nice, the homie. He's our homie. Or uh, our big homie, let's put it that way. And OST, other such tracks. The score for Street Dreams, music and entourage, lifestyle marketing, and the beat battle at the Root Down Sound Clash against Will I Am. Let's hear it. Fuck, it's a loaded question. <laughs> Fully loaded. Man, I mean that's a lot of it's a lot of different things in there, you know, and each one of those things is worthy of an hour-long fucking story. Or I could I can speak on the Will thing basically. Me me and Will Will to be fair, Will comes from the same... Will knows what the fuck we're talking about because Will came from the same shit we did. Will just happened to make a bunch of compromises and choices in his career that turned him into a hologram on CNN. And that's good for him, I guess, but I wouldn't judge my success by being a bird in Rio. You know what I'm saying? Uh, obviously, we have different um, goals and what we're trying to do, but at one point, we were right there neck and neck and uh my girlfriend and his girlfriend were best friends so we had personal issues and uh the beat battle was not just a battle of beats but it was a much bigger thing it was it was the bedroom dudes versus the guys who were willing to go on and be try to be bigger the guys who were willing to sell it all and give up everything that they had come from to be fucking megastars you know, to, to sign some random white girl into their group and, you know, dance for Dr. Pepper, you know. And so that beat battle was really charged. I mean, numerous fights broke out that night. It was some serious shit. There's a lot more than what was happening on the, on the film. But uh, I don't respect Will, you know. Let's put you like that. I don't respect that fucking dude. That he's been successful as shit. I saw that motherfucker on CNN making an ass of himself with Deepak Chopra. But... You know, your fucking money and your fucking shitty radio songs and all that sort of stuff. Uh, if that's your legacy you're leaving behind, that's fucking piss poor in my opinion, man. My kid's gonna fucking kick your records around, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anyways, but what were the other things? Lifestyle like marketing. Just go my people. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Lifestyle marketing was an uh, instrumental record made out of commercials touched me in a way. Uh, I think that when Mike and I started touring the States, we started seeing like, how do I put it, man? There's a certain, like, when you get out in the middle of America, there's a certain sort of like solitude, depression, and, and just kind of confusion. And I feel like Lifestyle Marketing as a record attempts to capture that, but it, we still see it, man. Like we go to cities like Gary, Indiana, and there's people just aimlessly walking in fucking the streets, like not going anywhere and shit, you know? So there's a creepy vibe to America too, it's, you know, and, and we're not just trying to, I don't know, man, I don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> You're beating Entourage, tell us about some of the music and street dreams. He made that beat. Okay. Yeah, we had a song on, yeah, the, on, on the show, it. Entourage. I can say I had never really watched the show, but once I heard we were on there, I definitely checked it out. Oh yeah, it was the, the Odell yeah. beat. Yeah. The Odell, yeah, it worked. 
I mean, you know, we were on The Simpsons, we were on Entourage, we've been on Entourage, we've done movie scores, we fucking rub shoulders with crazy fuck motherfuckers. But like I said, man, to go back to it, I really, I think it's a waste of breath to talk about these achievements because there's nothing better that ever happened to me than being recognized by Chuck D or Biz Marquis or Ice-T. Um, in my life, at least, you know. Being able to say that, you know, out of eight albums, George Clinton is on one. Right. You know, not one underground hip-hop group can say they got George Clinton on the record. You know what I'm saying? And that's my hero right there, the whole P-Funk box. So, you know, we have a lot of achievements that are more than just, oh, we did this many sales on this album, or we did this many tours. This shit that's personal to us and we're going to take with us, you know? I'd like to share with us about uh, George Clinton. You guys came and did the track and right, right, being George. one of your yeah, most important one of my idols. I mean, you know, as my friends and my wife, everyone says, man, you're fucking obsessed with the guy. I'm just very, you know, that's just, yeah, 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 yeah. I grew up on that music. It's, 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 it's music that doesn't sound like anything else. People have tried to do, you know, Parliament Funkadelic, they can't nail it. It's always a bad bite. So that's the music that moves me. And got him over to the house, asked him to record. I said, Des, check this out. Want to put it on the album? We have his permission. And we did. Have to go through the managers and no big thing like that. It was just all love. I mean, he's a member of the funk mob. That's that's that. He's he's in George's crew, you know. He's and that's one. The vinyl collection. Share some of your rarest white vinyl in the book behind the beat. The sample compilations. Mustache Soul. Mustache Soul is my private mind garden genre of it's dudes who make soul music in their bedroom, kind of like how we made hip hop, and it's just working with what you have, drum machines and this and that, whatever. I have a lot of records, but at one point in my life, my rec I felt like my records defined me. Like at one point in my life, I felt like if I can find rare records and sample them first, that means something. But I can honestly say that that shit doesn't fucking matter anymore. It doesn't because I go out, travel the whole world scouring for one rare record, and there's a dude who's downloading it from YouTube and making a beat before I even get to it. So it doesn't fucking matter anymore. That doesn't make me salty. It just means that you have to change your perspective and how you look at records. Like, we were out in the UK recently, and this dude said to me, Yo, man, mind you, we're in the middle of fucking nowhere in the UK. And I can tell you, proof positive, there's nothing in that town, without even stepping into the record store, there is nothing in that town that interests me, record-wise. It's impossible. There's nobody there who had a jerry curl, a slight crack problem, and a drum machine and was putting out independent records that might have ended up in that store. It's not going to happen. So, I didn't go beat digging before the show. I chose to stay in my room, take a dump, shave, take a nice hot shower, and then go to the show, relax. Yo, man, how come you weren't at the record store digging today before the show, man? Fuck, man, I thought you were about these records, man. So... The thing is, my point is, is that things have changed, and it's not like that anymore. And I think that everyone's perspective towards music and digging and all this sort of stuff has to change. And if the golden era was the golden era, it was good and it was great, but it isn't, it isn't the fucking end of the world. We've all moved on now. It's unfair to the younger generation to hold that shit over their heads and say, Yo, the golden era was the best era that there will ever be. You should have been there, but you weren't born yet. So fuck you, you'll never understand. You don't know what it's like to go digging for, you know. You can't do that to the kids, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's The youth need to be able to get into this shit too. And if YouTube is what they know, then fuck it. As long as you're listening to funky shit on YouTube, cool. Enjoy that shit. Make a beat, man. Let's jam. And anniversaries from the tenure of the L. Ray, Bluefoot's Backyard, and being on The Price is Right, winning the turntable. <laughs> Yo, the 10th anniversary uh, show at the El Rey. First of all, that was very special because that meant, you know, it was 10 years since our first album. And that was 2008, 98 was our first album. So that was special in itself that we were still around and was able to do a 10 year anniversary show. That just sounds big, you know. And uh, it was a dope show. We filmed it, we got a dope DVD out of it. It was a fucking awesome night. We did at least six songs from every single album that we had. There was a two hour set, almost killed me. Bluefoot's Backyard is a beautiful place. We have a lot of beer and instruments set up and barbecue cooking and his wife yelling at everybody. 
It's a beautiful thing, man. In LA, that's where we recorded all our interludes for Fun DMC back there one night. We were just getting drunk, stoned, and playing dominoes, and we had people clapping and singing along to the song. Had the pole tools rigged outside, you know, capturing LA from 6 p.m. to midnight. You know, that was beautiful. And the Ohms years, best venue that you guys put it down. Home years, home years. That still bugs me out that we have the greatest hits. You know, that's for people like Aerosmith and shit. You know, it's a dope collection of songs that we put out. The best venue that you've ever put it down in all history of people under the stairs. Best venue, man, that's hard. I don't know if we found it yet. I don't know if we found the best venue. Different categories. I mean, I would say that you know, Glastonbury and and, the, and Bonnaroo and those are big venues. Um, was awesome. The Fox Theater in Boulder, Colorado is what I would consider our anchor venue in the entire world. I mean, we in the El Rey. The El Rey. I love performing at all the House of Blues because they always cater really good backstage. That's just me. Fat boy. <laughs> yeah. And stay tuned, EP. The Stepfather, number 35 on the indie charts for Billboard. 43 labels I like. And the struggles of sampling for Highlighter. Highlighters are our album that came out last year. It's our newest album. And um, I think that it's a progression. After OST came out in 2002, everyone expected more and more jazz samples from us. And we had spent so many years digging through jazz records that I think we lost. I, I, I know I did. I got tired of people telling me what, like. They want to hear out of me. Right. Like, I, got, I had record dealers going, yo, man, this sounds like a people on a stair sample. I'd be like, what the fuck are you to tell me? If you know what a people on a stair sample sounds like, then you know what? I'll leave the group and you join the group <laughs> and you make the beats. If you know what a Thess One beat sounds like, then you make my beats, motherfucker. You don't know. You're not me. I hate that shit. So, anyways, uh, I basically said that's it for the jazz for me. And I think that, you know... Ever since then, we've been working in different fields and different genres and stuff. And Highlighter has more live playing than a lot of the earlier records, which is cool because we actually can take all of the knowledge we've had and direct it. We have, we're blessed to know people who can help us achieve that. Um, but we've, we did, that album has more live playing for samples than any record we've ever done. Yeah, no doubt. The whole album down there is every, there's live stuff being played on every song, almost. Yeah. Actually, every song there's a lot of playing on. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's one, your customized 40 OZ holders for Clax. And the red-headed stepfather. Red-headed stepfather was a thing that we did because... I didn't, I never called it that, actually. That was Rock who called it that, who was running the label. I, I don't... We released that shit as Stepfather. So what happened was, that was 2006. The internet was starting to take off, and everyone was all into Napster and downloading free music. So we had just finished Stepfather, so we put out a fake Stepfather piece. And we put out Stepfather and I asked a bunch of people who I knew who were really downloading this motherfuckers. Who, the guys back in the day who had all the shit on their desktop. And you know, they would download shit and people would download shit from their desktop. It was like file sharing. And so I said, yo, put this Stepfather album on your shit and let's see what happens to it. And fucking sure enough, like next thing we know, a week later, there's like 80,000 copies of that shit floating around the internet. Jokes on you. Joke, yeah, you know. So, that was what that was all about. And Fun DMC, the homage to Run DMC, Fun of the Leather mixtape, and the Ultimate 44, you have stayed true and constant since the start. Fun DMC, we definitely, we, we base our whole live show off of what? D running Jam Master J did back in the day. There's a lot of running around, cutting up breaks, getting real live, yelling at each other, pouring 40s everywhere. And that's what a hip hop show is supposed to be about because no, we don't have a band, you know what I mean? You know, when you have a band on stage, people would check out the guitar players, but if it's two MCs and a DJ, you gotta do a lot of work. You gotta get people, you know, keep their attention. And that, that was it. And plus, we love to have fun. So one day in Australia backstage, we looked at each other and said, yo, let's call the next album Fun DMC. Give a toast, and that was it. And so many artists, gym class heroes, opening for you, and many more. You've also opened for Deltron 3030, EPMD, Mac Miller. Best show, largest crowd you've ever rocked. 
Glassware was the largest crowd we've ever rocked. That was the largest, which was, the, yeah, Glassware was the largest crowd we rocked, but I think Bonnaroo was like, you know, for a big crowd, we really killed that crowd. I don't think they were expecting that. People were fucking, fucking, you know, in the crowd, and naked girls climbing up during our set. We're having, we're having fun watching that, you know, entertaining them. So I gotta say Bonnaroo was definitely hot. Like, how many people? Man, I don't know, 45,000? Yeah. Probably just in our tent, you know? Yeah. And for the newer generation, Matt Miller. Yeah, Matt those were big shows. So those were, track. Yeah, those were club shows that we went out tour with Matt Miller. Those were like four, three, four thousand people. Back. But yeah. I mean that it's so funny, man, how we and other rappers, I won't name names, have dealt with that situation of, of having a younger rapper rap on your track. We were stoked. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I was like, wow, so I was like, oh, okay, because I had never really heard my man's music because he was a young, you know, he's a youngster. And I know he was probably catering to the youngsters, you know, making little love songs, or whatever. But when my little sister, who's into that stuff, told me, yo, he's rapping over at San Francisco Heights, I said, okay, I was scared to listen to it. Checked it out, dude spit over it, I had no problems. I said, yeah, that was dope. You know, he gave us props, he gave us respect by, you know, taking our beat, saying, oh, this beat is dope, and then introducing that to, a, you know, a, a different generation that we had no idea what they're into. Shout out to Matt Miller, man. Yeah, what up? And Carried Away, number five on iTunes, the highlighter. Tell us about The Wiz, the helicopter ride, and share your legacy. The Wiz, The Wiz, The Wiz. That was a video, probably our first professional video, right? Yeah. That was our first real video. First video we ever did on film. On film. 35 We, we actually yeah. flew down to Australia to film this video. The song was about how much we loved gigging and hanging out and drinking beer and hanging with the people of, of Australia. And obviously, and uh, you know, came back and was just do a video for it. It's so beautiful down there, and we shot it. It's an awesome video. The helicopter, that was, I'll, I'll let him explain that. That was cold and crazy. Yeah, we had, uh, we had Matt Bird who directed the video. He had, uh, he had access, he was working with Fox Studios at the time, and so I said, what do you have at Fox Studios that no one's ever fucked with? He was like, well, we got a helicopter. I was like, all right, what else you got? Got a scuba diving team. All right. We'll take the scuba divers. We'll take the helicopter. We'll take the gyros. The gyro thing. He had this dude who had a bodysuit with a fucking gyroscopic camera mount. And when he would swing it, the camera would move. So when you watch the video, it's a fairly simple video, but there's a lot of extremely complicated shit going on. That Namely, the opening yeah, scene was yeah. filmed entirely underwater. That's me and him actually in the yeah, ocean. Yeah, it's not green screen. We're in that the was an actual fish swimming by us, and we that took about two, three hours to shoot. Yeah, we almost drowned we during that freezing. shit. We were freezing cold. You know. And Jem, San Francisco Nights, Acid Raindrops, share your favorite song and your project. Mm, man, I can't just pick that out of the air. I'm gonna think about it like that, man. I gotta say, oh, man. Favorite project? Got anything to come on quick? I love American Men. I love American Men because that's like that's the stuff that we didn't think people would dig, you know. So we put it out anyway. To me, that's probably one of our favorite, you know, yeah. joints that we put out there. It's not an official album, but it's so like edition. crazy limited edition. Like, well, I don't even have one right now, but I, I like that because that's really us. Lord Radio and Hell Bop is on there. A lot of songs that we were just like, you know, this doesn't fit into the album, but let's put it out anyway. It's so raw, it's raw people in the stairs. We were going on tour in Europe, and we decided to take all that stuff and press it up on CDs and take it with us. So we had, it says a thousand on the on the cover, but there was only there was only about seven, six, seven hundred, not even that. I think it was five hundred. And so we carried all that shit over to the UK, and they were in a bag, in a duffel bag, and the duffel bag had no wheels. And at that time in the UK, when we were touring. We didn't have a driver. We didn't have a manager or any motherfuckers carting us around. It was just us, like it is now. Train. But but we were on trains. And I remember after the third day, we were both like, yo, something's got to give here because we're fucking walking the train station, dragging all this merch and shit. We got to get rid of these American Men CDs. And we were in Manchester, and the dudes that, uh, the dudes that were working at... Uh, at uh, uh, what's the name of that store? Fat, Fat City. Fat City, yeah. They were like, yo, we know we know a record dealer who might be interested in buying these uh, CDs off of you. 
All right, cool, man. I just need to get rid of all these fucking things, man. Like, can't carry them around anymore. It's fucked up. So this dude came to the hotel. He had, like, a gun and shit. The motherfucker was crazy. But he had mad cash, and he was like, I'll take them. So we hopped in the car. He put the fucking burner under the seat. He pulled the cash out. Because he didn't trust me. He had, like, you know, I think he gave us, like, a 1,000 pounds or some shit. He gets something. Something that wasn't anywhere near what that shit is worth. It's worth its weight in fucking gold. So... 90% of all the original copies of American Man were left that night in an apartment yeah. building in oh, Manchester. Right. Oh, in Manchester. Manchester. Yeah, yeah. What happened to him? I don't know. You know? The type of dude he was, he might have sold a few. He probably just fucking dumped them. They're gone. And for each of you, your best hip hop memory you've been part of or contributed to? Oh, my best hip hop memory. I'm going to say it was 1988 going to the Tougher Than Leather tour, man, at uh, the Greek Theater. My brother and my cousin took me to go see Run DMC, Johnny Jeff, Fresh Prince, uh, EPMD, and the Beastie Boys, and, and Public Enemy. And I don't think I've had that much fun since. That was great. I'll never forget singing along word for word and bugging my cousin. I'm like, how does he know all this when he can't do a score? You know? <laughs> That's one of my favorite hip hop man. man, so many. One, one night I'll never forget was fucking being at the SIR theater at a Unity show in high school. And it was Resurrection had just dropped. It was Common Sense, The Beat Nuts, Organized Confusion, and Artifacts. Oh, and, and Black Eyed Peas. Yeah, they got booed off the stage that night. They were at Back Planet, I think. Weren't they? No, they were Black, Black Eyed Peas. They got booed off the stage. Um, and that, they were at Back Planet. They were at Back Planet. They had a Mexican dude with the long hair. And uh, that night, now this is not, the memory is not being there. The memory is Mark Love, ultimate OG DJ from LA, friends with Bigger B, rest in peace, who was the AR at Loud Records at the time, had given Mark at this big monumental show. This show was the biggest shit in LA that year, maybe that decade. And for that night, they had pressed up a dub plate of a previously unfucking heard no one had ever heard it record presented it to Mark in the booth the whole fucking club is packed Mark oh, fucking yeah, drops yeah. the needle on it and that shit goes ding 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 and everyone's like what the fuck is this ding 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 whole crowd silent everyone's like what the fuck is this and and mind you the speakers were huge right ding 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 just piano and then all of a sudden ooh baby I like it raw and the bass was and the fucking everybody, everyone was like, because we knew ODB had a solo record coming. Right, right, right. We knew it was coming, but to be there in that moment and to hear that shit. I remember that time, I, my, my chest felt like it was about to fall Fucking out of believable, my man. Shirt, because the bass was so heavy. And I would always like to get to the show early and stand near the, the, the woofers and like get the whole experience. We were those dudes, like we were like the ones in line. Yeah. First, like let's get there at six o'clock so we can run to the front of the stage. You know, we couldn't buy shit from the bar. So we just sat there smoking our beanies in the front. You know what I mean? We loved hip hop like that. We still do, but we were those kids back in the day, man. And I remember that night. Dude, as soon as the beat dropped, I mean a lot of smoke in the air after that. Man, <laughs> people just people couldn't fucking believe it, man. Like you couldn't get a better moment than that, you know? Because ODB was a character on 36 Chambers, but no one knew how he was going to come on a solo record. And then when you heard that song, he came hard, he just he do it. Like you know, hard, cool, I think man. Mark played it twice, actually. He I think did, he played he it did. once, picked up the he was like, to. fuck that, he and played to. it again. He had to. Rest in peace, old dirty bastard, man. I mean, you know, fuck what he went through when he was alive. That dude gave us a dope ass part. And it came from that dude. Fuck what people said. Any stories with Dollar Bill? Dollar Bill, let's talk about Dollar Bill. Dollar Bill is my uncle, he's, he's, he's crazy, and uh, you know, he would love to know that you asked about him. If he was here, he, he'd take up all the time on your, on your table. Hey, I know all about the run DMC, you know what I'm saying? Word, word, 40 yeah. bucks. Oh yeah, oh yeah, DMC owes him $40, and he was gonna go collect it, but we stopped At him. House of Blues. At House of Blues, we stopped him because Someone came upstairs and was like, we had just got off stage. What? Someone was like, yo, DMC was out there watching y'all. And me, I'm like, DMC, you know what I'm saying? So we were like, and my uncle Dollar Bill, he says, oh, DMC? He owes me 40 bucks, let me go talk to him. 
And then he proceeded to tell us why he owed him, I guess, because he played Sucky MC. This payola from 84, <laughs> dude. This fucking guy. So, yeah, and then actually went downstairs to DMC, looked at both of us, and was like, gave us that. I'm just like, wow. What, what else can you fucking ask for? You know what I mean? What else can you ask for? The, the fucking night with Chuck D, right? It was Stetsasonic, people on the stairs, Chuck Houdini. D, Just Eyes, Houdini. And everyone was just fucking hugged up, you know? Yeah, except Keith Murray, he had a little chip on his shoulder. I wanted to say what's up to him. He looked at me like, don't talk to me, big man. But it's cool, I talked to Chuck D, you know? Excellent. And anything you guys want to talk about gear? I know you love gear. Oh, man. Anything that you can gear. let the gearheads know about. Man, all I would say is this. Gear is great, but gear is fucking expensive. And gear should never fucking ever dictate what you make. Word, I knew you was You know what I'm say. saying? Because whatever you're comfortable with, yeah, fuck do with the next man. Whatever you have, make that shit work. Because just like Cool Herc took that fucking stereo amp and turned it into a DJ mixer, and, and dudes were fucking with shit in New York back in the day. Just like San Francisco Nights, one of our most famous songs, was literally made on a tape cassette four track with hardly any fucking gear. We had an effects box that was smaller than that. Yeah. That's what we did all our effects on. It was a little guitar and one of those joints you brought in your guitar. Silver, just like that. That's what we had all the effects yeah. on. Gear is like caviar. It's like, it's food, kind of, but it's not fucking, it's not going to sustain you. What's going to sustain you in, in this is your talent, your creativity. You should, no one should ever fucking take a loan out or max their credit card out thinking that buying a new whatever is going to make them a better producer. It's not. Being a better producer comes from your heart and your head. You guys have anything to say to Canada? Canada, we love you. And thanks for always having us up here and treating us with the most utmost respect and digging our music, man. Everywhere, the whole, the whole, the whole country, the whole country. And you guys have any shouts? Shout, I want to shout out Bluefoot. I want to shout out Martin. I want to shout out Dollar Bill. I want to shout out Canada. I want to shout out Vancouver, Toronto, Quebec, everywhere. I want to shout out That's One. I want to shout out you, man. You know, everyone that's been supporting us. I want to shout out hip hop as a whole. All the forefathers, old school, cool work, and he said, Flash, Melly Mel, we wouldn't be here without them. Right? I appreciate capturing real history, real hip hop documentation with you guys. Props to Thez One, Double K, Timber, and this is the Archivist, and you already know the name, y'all. The Archivist, big time.